David Llewellyn is the next speaker. Uh, when I was um, teaching um, bioethics in law school um, many years ago, I invited David to come and speak to my bioethics class on, on the topic of circumcision. And he walked into the room and walked in front of the class and introduced himself as a penis lawyer and <laughs> changed. I, I think between the fact that I spent two weeks out of the semester on, on this issue and David's presence uh, changed a lot of minds. In fact, I would say all but, all but one mind in the class of 15. Uh, and people still write to me and talk to me about that class and, uh, and mention David being there. So um, without any further words from me, David Llewellyn. I started that in Padua, sono avvocato di pene, because I, I, had, I didn't know any Italian except that, and I needed to say something, and everybody laughed, and it stuck. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, this is like old home week. I'm glad we get together. It really is. You are, have become my family. It's, it's strange to think a, a, a three-piece suit guy from UVA would end up here, but you know, life is strange, OK? Uh, and I think, despite what I'm going to talk about may seem hopeless, but we actually are making some progress. I'm going to talk about the high points, the low points, and if I have enough time, I'll answer questions. I'm happy to answer anything anybody wants. Just corner me. Um, I'm a trial lawyer. I have to make a living doing this, which means theory is great, but practice is another whole thing. Okay? And uh, let's look, first of all, about some facts about litigation. Medical malpractice cases are about the hardest cases in the law. Why? Juries love doctors and hospitals, and frankly, they hate lawyers and are skeptical of plaintiffs. The billboards, folks, do not help, okay? The defense has at least a 90% chance of winning. I didn't make this up. This is a statistic. In Georgia and in New Mexico, that has been borne out statistically. Nationwide, according to, a, a, there's a state court group in Williamsburg, they came up with a figure that's less than 7%. I think about six or seven percent of cases are one that go to trial of all types of med mal cases. All right? They're very hard to win and they're hard to settle, the regular cases. Mag Mutual in Georgia, which insures about 70 percent of the doctors there, has a 90 percent win rate. That was published a couple of years ago. Pro Assurance that I go against in Alabama all the time tries most, if not all, of its cases why they win and they save money. The additional facts most plaintiffs are young parents without any money. The lawyer usually has to finance the case out of his own pocket. In other words, if I put $20,000 into a case and don't win, that's $20,000 that's gone. Okay? Uh, cases cost between $15,000 and $50,000 or more. I don't think I've ever spent 50. I'm conservative, but $25,000 to $35,000 is not unusual for a botched circumcision case. Uh, if they can't be, uh, I, and when I advance expenses, the IRS will not allow me to deduct them as ordinary business expenses because I expect to recover them back, so I have to book them as client loans. When I get them back, if I do, then they are, they are not taxable to me. But, you know, basically the lawyer has to eat the costs. Contingency fees, therefore, have to be high, 40 to 50 percent plus expenses. And generally, if I'm allowed to in a state, I charge 50 percent plus expenses because of this risk. However, many states limit my fees. And it's interesting which ones do. The, liberal, the so-called liberal states do. New York, Massachusetts, and California limit the fees. Here in, this, here in California, you have to deduct the expenses first before you calculate the fee, which is just unbelievable. Uh, and that makes it hard to bring cases. And it's why probably you're looking at him when it comes to people who do this sort of work regularly for, in penis cases. The defense has unlimited funds and will expend the same. Their fees are not limited by law, but only by the market. The defense lawyers have every incentive to bill. They send pointless interrogatories, the ones that they, which are questions we have to answer under oath. Many of them they know uh, are overly broad, so they know I'm going to waste time objecting, objecting to them, but I have to because if I don't object, then I have to answer them. I just did a, a deposition that took about 45 minutes on direct. This is on Tuesday of one of my experts for trial. They did a two and a half hour cross-examination going to everything imaginable. And they never settle without doing depositions, no matter how clear the case. It's that simple. Uh, lawyers have to pay rent, salaries, overhead, and eat. We spend much of our time answering questions for free, particularly in this area. Basically, myself, as well as other lawyers, can only take, afford 
to take cases that we think we can win. We can't bring lawsuits that are pushing the envelope unless we are paid by somebody. I can go into this in more detail, but I, but I just hit on it. Class actions, claims that parents can't consent, equal protection are all nice theories. But when you get right down to it, if I go too far, there's a little thing called Rule 11 in the federal courts, and most state courts have it, that say if you bring a frivolous case, which of course is in the eyes of the beholder, you get to pay the other side's attorney's fees and costs. And when people want me to sue bravely, then they're going to have to come up with a brave amount of money so that I can pay $500 an hour or more to the defense firm, okay, if they, if they get me on Rule 11 sanctions. And, and frankly, I'm just too old to take a $100,000 risk of having to pay out of my pocket to somebody else. So bringing brave cases uh, takes money. Lawyers also don't make the law. We only enforce it or, or argue for its advancement. We, like the courts, are constrained by prior decisions. For example, with, it would be impossible to even touch on the 14th Amendment. But basically, if you're going to enforce the 14th Amendment, you have to sue a state actor under what's called 42 U.S.C. 1983. Okay, and they have qualified immunity, which means if there isn't a case that says it was wrong, then how would they know it was unconstitutional? Okay, and so they get a free bite at the apple. I'm serious, folks. I didn't make this up. All right. I'll give you an example. Foster parents in Georgia, okay, beat a child or cause a child's death by beating him. Because they are State Tort Claims Act says they're state actors, we can't sue them for battery. Okay, so you can't sue them there. The Eleventh Circuit held, well, parenting is not an exclusive state action, therefore they are not state actors for the purposes of 14 U.S.C. 1983. Right now in Georgia there is no remedy except the criminal law for a foster child who's beaten uh, even to death by a foster parent. Okay? Courts generally follow the society. They rare, the courts rarely lead society. We tell you, it's already been talked about, and it's just a truism. The courts are constrained by the Constitution. Many judges are elected and therefore have to be responsible to the electorate. They bring their own baggage about what's normal in their own religion. They tax upon what I call the paradigm and the ancient are met with skepticism. That's why you know, everybody thought that 1996, I talked about this, there is no magic bullet in the law that's going to end circumcision. It just isn't going to happen. The First Amendment, I believe, is a real stumbling block to outlawing circumcision in this country. I, you, whether we like it or not, I think it is there. And even if it weren't, all we have to do is look at what's happened in San Francisco, here in California, Germany, and Iceland, to see how difficult really outlawing circumcision is going to be. It may happen, but I don't think it's going to be soon. So how can we use the law effectively? Well, I think we bring suits that have a good chance of being won. We bring enough of them to get attention of the doctors, hospitals, insurers, and parents. And if another solid case will let you push the envelope, I'm all for it. In the Stowell case, where a young man came to me at 18 and was angry that he was circumcised, we find out his mother did not want to consent. Had signed a consent form but didn't remember doing it because she was on Demerol. She'd been given Demerol at 4.30 in the morning and she signed it at 7.30 in the morning. Had no idea she'd signed it and uh, was surprised when she got him home. So we actually sued and I raised everything in that case and we were able to settle it. I don't know what would have happened if we'd actually gone further. We had a very good judge who set aside his religion and followed everything right in courts with the law. Federal judge on Long Island is absolutely excellent. All right, but each, at, each suit at least educates the doctors and the defense lawyers. That's one reason I'm willing to do this. I know that when I go in and I go through all the, all the stuff we do here about the, the anatomy and the function, that the lawyers may laugh at me, oh, 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 you're an idiot. But you know what? They think about it, okay? And then they talk to people. And the defendants talk to people. The first case, the Maryland got me involved in this in 1995. The doctor who had, it was a wrongful circumcision case in Montgomery, Alabama. The doctor after the case said, I didn't know any of this, and I'll reconsider. I don't know if he stopped doing them, but at least he thought about it, okay? So each suit proves the da dangers and the damage caused by circumcision. All right, consider where we were in 1971. Here's an article, it's on CIRP, you can find it. Here was the opinion of a lawyer for the AMA. A lawsuit arising from a circumcision is, an extreme, is extremely unlikely statistically. Such a simple procedure is, of course, not likely to produce great complications. The usual requirements of standards of skill and care and knowledge, however, do apply to this as to any other surgery. Well, unlikely, there's a plastibel injury from the internet on the left. That's a gomco injury in a child that I represented on the right. 
not unusual. Here's a Mogan ablation with the um, glands um, reapproximated, and the jury didn't think that was worth much. And here's one where that chunk was removed and it had already been discarded, okay, and, and I did get a significant recovery, a settlement for that child, okay. This, this lawyer went on. It should be noted, however, that if parents of a newborn baby do not want him circumcised, make this fact known to the obstetrician or hospital, and the procedure is carried out by mistake or failure to read the patient's records, a suit for assault and on behalf of the baby may well succeed. Damages, however, would be comparatively minimal unless the parents could prove negligence in the manner in which the procedure was carried out. Disagree with that, all right, and we'll get to it in a minute. In a few states, which have very liberal decisions on allowing damages for mental anguish, it is at least possible that parents would also have a cause of action for mental anguish, although no decisions on the subject can be found in those states. Care, therefore, should be taken to note the mother's hospital records that she has not, in fact, consented to the procedure. Well, the way I got involved in this was a wrongful circumcision case, which is, I've done a number of them, uh, preventing circumcisions, botched infants, botched adults, and forced retraction cases, which are the type of cases I've handled over the years. Wrongful circumcisions. Marilyn got me involved in the case. That's how I got started in all this. In 1995, with Jim Snyder down in, with Hugh V. Smith, Jr. at the Law Center in Montgomery, Alabama. And we tried that case and got a $65,000 verdict, which was a record at that time. Okay, and um, I was nervous as hell, I'll tell you, because I wanted to win and prove, and I probably overproved the case, but we prevailed. Interestingly enough, that started to produce other cases, but the next case, I didn't have as good a judge, and, uh, and even though the defense really cheated in that case, we had a defense verdict, but I'd settled with the hospital before, and then the, the other one that I've tried was in Indiana, where the, uh, in Muncie, where they argued, this is what we do to our children in this community. And even though in Indiana, you have to go to a medical board, and they could bring the medical board in, this guy came in and said, well, it was wrong, but there's no harm done at all. Jury bought it, zero, okay? Uh, but settlements, I've had about 20 since 1999, with a general range in the middle five figures, which certainly hasn't made me rich, but it's kept me in business. My next to the last case was in Georgia, and it was settled in 2011 with a circumcision in 2009. And look at all the states where I had them, all across the country. It appears that most hospitals are now using timeouts before doing circumcisions. I don't know if the Joint Commission requires it now, but it didn't used to be the fact, but they are. And I hope my suits had something to do with it. What is it? Oh, a timeout is that the, the nurse says, I've looked at the chart, and they get the doctor together and they say, look, we've got, here's the, we've got a permission slip. And we check the number on the permission slip with the number on the baby. And we know this is a circumcision to both the doctor and the nurse agree. Okay, it's called a timeout. And they do it before all sorts of medical procedures to make sure they don't cut off the wrong leg or operate on the wrong eye and the like. They, they didn't used to do them in circumcision cases. They do now. But I have a case, the most recent case just arose in Georgia, where the parents didn't want it done, they still have the original consent form because it was never collected. Doctor did it anyway, and the nurse certified to a timeout in the record. And I, that one, I hope I will get settled. But it is the first one since 2011 to come into my office. So I think that means that, so, that I hope that what I've done has had some good effect and has at least kept babies intact who the parents want, whom the parents wanted to remain intact. Okay? That's the good news. Now, preventing circumcisions. Um, these don't usually get in the news. Some of them have been. I worked on three that came uh, to sort of satisfactory resolutions. Okay? I had hearings in, in uh, three and really in a fourth where it was a change of custody and the mother was worried that the, baby, that the father wanted to circumcise the children. In Nevada, after the hearing, um, the, the, uh, it settled to everybody's satisfaction, which is all I can say about it, but you can draw what you will from that. In Pennsylvania, interestingly enough, I lost. It was, uh, it was a very disappointing case. Uh, in, in Illinois, however, in the Nisnik case, and I can use that name because that's a public name, we actually said we had a, two, two hearings, and the Judge Kaplan there looked and said, well, the boy can decide when he's 18. Okay, I mean, he did a really good job. He really listened to the evidence. And so those can be won. But let me say, in parental dispute cases, you can win, but you've got to present clear and convincing evidence. 
You've got to set the case up correctly from the beginning. You've got to have good expert witnesses who know what they're talking about, about function, risks, lack of necessity. The lawyer needs to know the anatomy, the functions of the foreskin, et cetera, and the lawyer has to believe in the case. And I think the cases where that have not been successful, and many of you know which ones I'm talking about, things weren't set up right from the beginning, and the lawyer didn't know enough to be able to cross-examine somebody like Dr. Charles Flack, and I wish I'd been able to cross-examine him because I know what he's seen. By this point, I'm getting to know every urologist in the country, okay, because Flack, who in the case of many of you know what I'm talking about, testified, well, I wouldn't do it, but you know, if they want it done, I'd do it, okay? Flack had already treated one of my clients who'd lost most of his glands penis in a circumcision, okay? He should have known better, okay? I don't mind saying it because that's how I feel about it, and he put himself in the public eye by testifying. Okay, but, but the point is, is that you've got to be able to cross-examine and know what you're doing, okay? Um, botched infant circumcisions, I've had a number, I've had four trials of them. Uh, we got a very large verdict for a loss of about a third of the glands, maybe half of, maybe three quarters of the glands in Georgia in 2009. But the hospital walked because the nurse who walked around all night going, I think we cut it off, never got a urologist in, but tried to get a pediatrician to come in who wouldn't come in. The pediatrician got nailed, but the nurse was nice. She tried. The jury let her off. Point is, juries like nice people, okay? And they don't do what you would think they would do if people are nice. Um, the, the, little, the one I just showed you where the, there was a reattachment with the Mogan, uh, a jury, they had a very good jury for the defense. The defense lawyer just admitted it to me, and I only got a $30,000 verdict. But we had entered into what's called a high-low agreement. No matter what happens, you'll get X but you won't take more than Y, even if you get more, okay? So that sort of salvaged that case. Um, in South Carolina in 2014, uh, myself and another lawyer got $215,000 for a shaft stripping case, GOMCO. But in Massachusetts in 2015, our experts sort of collapsed. The judge didn't like me. I think a little bit of uh, you're a Southerner and I don't like Southerners sort of thing seriously. I, I believe, even though my grandparents were buried, are buried in the same county where I tried the case, it was bad defense verdict. Um, hearings, uh, I got a default judgment for over $10 million against Mogan Circumcision Instruments Limited. That's nice. I have a plaque on my wall. I've never recovered a penny. They're out of business. They've been administratively dissolved. We can't find a penny. Uh, so there was a lot of work. Uh, that was given to us by Jack Weinstein, 96 years old, oldest federal judge still on the bench. He was outraged. Because, and the reason is, of course, Mogan in its literature said, can't happen. No damage to glands possible. Okay. But uh, they'll just tell you, you can get a big verdict, and so what? I mean, a big judgment, and so what? They went into default. The second time they had, they never answered complaints. They just ignored everything. <coughs> They're a small family firm. The Mogan clamp today is manufactured by, there is no, the patent's expired. Anybody can make one. You can go on the internet, and about 10 companies have them. Go, go look at uh, Alibaba. has hundreds of them, okay? Now, settlements for adults, how, I mean, for children, I've had about 22 since 2002. Uh, 12 Gomco, 4 Mogan, 2 Plastibel, 1 a Jewish Shield, uh, 1 a Bone Biter. You, actually, that was uh, somebody put up that picture earlier today, a thing that's there. Terrible way to do a circumcision. And 1 with no shield of protection, and that was a religious circumcision. Um, in, however, I, I had 2 that I had to dismiss, and 1 my experts sort of failed me. And in 1, the treating doctor actually destroyed the case intentionally. One of a, a well-known doctor. So, well, many things can happen. I can't say what went on, and that was just about the end of that case. Okay? It was a shaft tripping case at Gomco some time ago. Pending, I have two in Florida, uh, pending or about to get filed, two in Florida, two in Georgia, one in Louisiana, Massachusetts, Maryland, Missouri, and New Jersey, all but one at Gomco. Uh, one involves lack of consent plus negligent operating, and one involves the, entire, the loss of the entire glands by necrosis. Okay? It's a very bad case. All devices are dangerous and have real risks. These are the lessons. Gomco seems to cause more problems, mostly shaft stripping. Mogan seems to cause the most devastating injuries, loss of all or part of the glands. And the plastibel can slip under the glands and gouge it. Here are examples. Gomco shaft stripping. The, this child was repaired really well by, uh, I'll put in a, a plug for him, a guy named uh, William Strand, who's in Plano, right outside of Dallas, is a fabulous surgeon, was able to take that remnant and spread it around the glands. And, and even though we got a good result for the boy, uh, he has had a good surgical result. Uh, the one on the right is the child from South Carolina. 
and shows, but the consistency of everything is quite different when you sh strip the shaft. Um, the plastobel gouging, because I didn't have permission of the client, I didn't put up the one that I did. This is one from uh, Tim's website. Uh, but that's what it looks like when the, when the bell slips down onto the glands and, and isn't taken off in a timely manner. And then on the right is, is a Mogan gland sublation of a child. You can see there's almost no glands left. All right. Botched adult, so, so much for, oh, these things don't happen very often. Botched adult circumcisions, they seem to be legion. It happens mostly to heavy men like me. Uh, I would be very careful about letting any doctor near me with a knife. Uh, <laughs> In California in 2003, they will recircumcise a heavy guy because they don't understand that the reason he's got loose skin is because the, the, the skin of the penis is loose, the pubic fat as it accumulates pushes everything forward, and he doesn't need to be recircumcised, but they do it anyway. And in, in California, we managed to get a, oh, just over, Charles Bonner and I got over a $500,000 arbitration award for a man and his wife. In South Carolina, we tried one where we thought we'd won. It was really funny. It ended up 11-1 for the defense on a Friday night at 6 o'clock, and I moved for a mistrial, and the defense said, oh, no, judge, send it back. They can do it. They can do it. Went back. Half hour later, came back for the plaintiff. There was one, one holdout said, I ain't leaving until I award some money. They all wanted to go eat dinner, all right? But they only gave us a $30,000 verdict. I think my expenses were 24000 We let the clients keep the rest, and my thanks for that case was a nasty letter from the wife about why I didn't split costs with them. And I go, wait a minute. <laughs> all right, okay? All right. In Georgia, uh, for a young man, myself and another lawyer got a million eight verdict, which is a shaft stripping with bringing the scrotum forward and creating a penal scrotal web. Very good plaintiff. That's why that one worked out. Um, and, however, in Alabama in 2017, there was a defense verdict for an older man. Race may have been an issue there. Um, it was a small town, and not, the judge was great. In Pennsylvania, uh, a couple of months ago, we scared him into giving us a high-low while the jury was out, which was lucky because they came back a defense verdict. They started, we ended up, we found out at the end was, you, only, you have to have a 10-2 verdict out of 12. And it was eight for us, three undecided, one against. And then when they brought them back on Friday, and it got to be one o'clock, all at once it was a defense verdict, OK? <laughs> uh, but we did recover some, some money for him, not what he deserved. So what are the, and then also I've had settlements in Florida, Georgia, Mississippi, and Washington. Um, I did have a, a, a case I talked about in another seminar where, oh, I just got one minute. All right, let's go through the lessons. Here are the examples of damage before and after. Uh, th this is before and after, same guy, okay? You see what happens. This is the same guy, penal scrotal webbing. Very, very common in, uh, because they don't, and there's a repair of a guy who's not heavy, but that's what he ended up with. And this is a good repair by a, by a surgeon in Georgia who's fabulous. Why? Because this shows the action of the Dartos fascia. That's why knowing anatomy really matters. If you don't know the name, at least you know how it works. On the left, the first line is at the glands, all right, and if you, if you stretch it back, though, it's at the base. So if you're cutting, if what you do is you go in, well, I'm going to take off all this and take that like that, you've taken off all the shaft skin. And then the skin you've got left, you think is shaft skin, but it's not. It's really scrotal skin, abdominal skin, and that's how all those accidents happen. You can see here the mechanism of injury. And then I got forced retraction cases. I have no time to do this, but I have uh, done a few, okay? They aren't worth a lot of money, but the one I got going right now, uh, in the Parks case, uh, I put out a press release on it. I thought it was so important because this hospital, Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, has a policy apparently of washing under the foreskins of all boys, which is wrong. Okay, and they tore the foreskin back in my client. Their defenses didn't happen. Parents wouldn't know. This is what the, the lawyer told me. Parents wouldn't know. These are medical professionals. I said, okay, all right. So that one I'm going to go forward with. If I have to try it, I will to make a point. I'm determined to end it, but because they aren't worth a whole lot of money, it's really, it's almost impossible for me to go to other states unless a parent has money to pay me to do it. Okay, this is about normal foreskin development. We've already touched on that. Then I've got these other pending cases, not to brag, but a lot of them. Okay, and here's progressive retractability. We've already touched on that today. It is age 10 and a half, uh, born out of my own family. Everybody's different. I know kids who are retractable at four, and at 10 and a half, still partially adherent, all normal. Okay, success. Number of botches does appear to be decreasing. Two suits, however, I have two suits against the same doctor who didn't reform after the first one, okay, and I've got a pending suit against that doctor's expert witness who ignored the warnings from, that I gave her in the first case, okay. 
Only the worst cases get publicity, but recovery is important, and that's why I do this stuff, okay? Lessons, infants are easier than adults. Parents have to be likable. Parents can't be greedy. Severity of, in severity of injury matters. Same thing with adults, I think weight. Be one of those matters. Uh, the juries don't like fat people, frankly. Age matters, employment status matters, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, makeup of juries matter. Oh, I do want to touch on one thing. Never, ever, ever destroy any medical record in your position, possession without making sure your lawyer has a copy, because if you do, it'll be considered spoliation. And as John Geishaker and I learned to our sadness in a case, it can be fatal. Okay? And stay off of social media. What, the, what you say on social media is there forever. It's good for all of us. Be careful what you say because you're going to have to eat it and live with it. And I think about that every time I comment. Okay? Praying for a verdict, by the way, doesn't work. Everybody's prayed for one, finds out what Jesus thinks about money, which is nothing. Now, you would think they'd studied enough, they know that, but forget about it. Okay? All right? Why do I keep doing this? Thanks to Brother K, we have these pictures of post circumcision babies. If you look at those faces, right there, right there, all right, this is why I'm willing to keep on doing this stuff, okay, for these kids, all right? Sorry, we don't have more time. I love you guys too.